Hello, welcome everyone to the content creation on AWS Keynote. My name is Will McDonald. I run the product team for content creation at Amazon Web Services. And I'm super excited to talk to you all about some of the really exciting things that we've had come up over the last year. Some of the learnings, observations, and some of the new things that we've been able to uh, develop to really service the content creation industry. And I figured first we'd kick it off by showing some of the really great work some of our customers have been doing on the cloud with us. Take it away. So as you saw, some really awesome projects have been running on AWS really across uh, multiple fronts. Uh, and we talk about three in particular during this presentation. Uh, one is rendering, the second is virtual workstations, and the third is infrastructure. So I'll walk you through each one during this presentation. The first one is virtual workstations. And this is obviously taken uh, uh, quite an interesting turn, uh, particularly as we've headed into this year with everything going on. There's a bit of a recap on virtual workstations and some of the benefits. You know, Obviously we've got uh, the ability based on our G4 workstations uh, to produce high performance graphics, scale at speed. Uh, we have to support all the applications that our customers use, uh, the simplicity of data management. Um, all of these benefits are well known. One of, one of the things that we've really learned over the last uh, couple of years here is virtual workstations allow you to uh, not only burst your comport or compute resources, but you can burst your workforce as well. And what we mean by that is it allows you to have the ability to uh, scale up your workforce based on your project needs. Uh, so if I'm a studio and all of a sudden I'm going from a couple of projects to several projects, I'm going to need to staff that up very quickly. But the trick has always been, how do I do that in a way where I'm not taking on a lot of risk in the form of purchasing a lot of upfront hardware, which I may not end up using uh, in the next months down the line. Uh, this is where virtual workstations has really been able to take off. So if we talk a little bit about um, some of the backbone services uh, that help fuel virtual workstations for our customers, we have to start with our Amazon EC2 G4 instances. And for those who aren't, who aren't aware, uh, those, those are our GPU-based instances that we're really targeting for graphics-intensive applications, machine learning, video transcoding. Most importantly for this session, uh, it's about virtual workstations. Uh, it includes the latest NVIDIA T4 Tensor Core GPUs. Uh, my favorite thing is it includes the uh, ray tracing cores, um, really useful for real-time applications, uh, such as using Epic Games Unreal Game Engine uh, and their real-time ray tracing technology. Some really exciting things that we're seeing in the space, uh, revolving real-time graphics that are able to take advantage of things that we've brought to bear on our G4 instances. So another important thing about virtual workstations is because it's on AWS, it's able to take advantage of a global cloud infrastructure that already exists. And the reason why that's so important today is if you think about starting a studio now, let's pretend that you're looking to start your studio or extend your studio and maybe 
Vancouver makes a lot of sense to tap into with talent. Lots of visual effects and animation work happening there, particularly on the animation side. Um, and maybe we want to extend out uh, to London over time, then on down to Sydney, uh, and then eventually over to Montreal, let's say. All these visual effects and animation hotspots. But the really interesting thing about using cloud resources for your studio is that you're able to take advantage of um, uh, geographically convenient resources that AWS brings to bear. And what's important about that from a virtual workstations perspective is that it allows you to have uh, uh, a smaller amount of latency considerations because we have so many regions near production hotspots like the ones that I just mentioned. So a common question I typically get asked when people look at this map is they say, well, there's one thing missing here. What about Los Angeles? Uh, traditionally, Amazon has had uh, West Coast regions uh, such as in San Francisco or in Portland. But what if I want to use virtual workstations in Los Angeles? Am I going to get the latency requirements necessary to be able to run virtual workstations with all the demanding things that my artists have? Things like Wacom Tatlist with high pressure sensitivity. Uh, am I going to have a low enough amount of latency to be able to do that from my studios in LA? Well, at reInvent last year, we were able to say yes in the form of uh, local zones, uh, particularly in Los Angeles. And the key here is uh, our Los Angeles local zone provides the, the very same G4 instances that we have in our other regions, but closer to our studios here in Los Angeles. And this really represents uh, our focus on making sure that we're providing the very best services and capacity to our customers uh, where they sit, uh, be it in Los Angeles, be it in Vancouver, Montreal, London, Sydney, uh, the list goes on. But it's really important from a virtual workstation standpoint to have the, the relevant instance types, in this case, G4 instances back to um, uh, by our G4 instances, but also to be sure that our uh, infrastructure is geo convenient so that you can get the proper latency or uh, lack thereof latency, I should say, uh, to be able to actually have the interactivity you need. Uh, through single monitors, double monitor and monitors uh, using 4K, uh, we've taken a lot of focus around the idea of being able to deliver the right infrastructure and the right services for customers looking to create content on virtual workstations. So how does this all come together? So as we kind of talked about, uh, virtual workstations are based off of our G4 instances, backed off of the NVIDIA T4 GPUs, which include the RT cores, which I've uh, previously romanced about. But key to the infrastructure is also the software um, and the ability to use the software that you want to use. And that's really the trick around using uh, what we call Amazon machine images to load the software that artists use every day. Things like 3ds Max, Maya, Nuke, Katana, Houdini. We have a wide breadth of supported uh, applications and partnerships uh, with folks like Autodesk, Foundry, side effects, uh, Epic Games, and so forth uh, to allow software applications to be used in a virtualized way. And one of the interesting things that we uh, also do is we partner closely with streaming protocol providers like Teradici to be able to actually stream these pixels from the cloud to your monitor. We also have other solutions like our own DC feed technology, you can also use uh, just general remote desktop capabilities uh, that ship with OSs. There are many different ways of being able to stream in the pixels from G4 workstations. And ultimately the key is to be able to bring in uh, the same experience from the cloud uh, that you would if the box were just sitting under your feet uh, at a studio. Um, so this architecture is a way of being able to do that. And it's that combination again of being able to have leverage AWS resources in combination with software that we support in combination with either partners or technology that we provide around streaming these pixels back. So a lot of our customers are already having success with this over the last couple of years, one of which are our friends at Tangent Animation who have been able to leverage virtual workstations to be able to scale out their, uh, their creative force in a really effective way. Uh, you'll be hearing from uh, Jeff on one of our panels here coming up. Uh, it'll be interesting to kind of uh, learn from his experience in leveraging virtual workstations on AWS 
to again, uh, have a flexible way of scaling up and down uh, both the resources needed for virtual workstations, uh, as well as being able to easily bring on people to help with projects as they spin up. Another example of a successful customer would be the Molecule. The Molecule used was one of uh, our close partners in Teradici to be able to provide artists with a really great streaming experience using G4 workstations on AWS. And key to this, as they speak about, is being able to use a variety of tools uh, uh, using AMIs as well. Things like Nuke, Maya, Houdini, uh, many of the ones that are already spoken about in previous slides, um, they're using that on AWS EC2 instances. Uh, and the, the idea here is that the experience really mirrors what they've always had uh, in the studio, but it provides far more flexibility and control, both in terms of being able to have different specifications of machines, as well as being able to quickly spin them up and then spin them back down again uh, upon being finished with work. So we have plenty of resources uh, uh, that we bring to bear in terms of virtual workstations and beyond. Uh, I definitely encourage everyone to check out our resources link posted here below. Uh, we have uh, some quick start guides to allow you to get up and running quickly. Uh, we've done a lot of work in this area, um, particularly over this last year in helping people become successful in using virtual workstations on AWS. And I think the benefit has truly been really exciting, not only in the near term, but also long term, is customers thinking more and more about, hey, how do I set up my studio um, to be a global studio in the future? And how do I have a how do I have the flexibility in being able to leverage a global talent no matter where they sit? I think some of the um, uh, events of this last year have really posed a lot of questions um, that we've been really excited to help out with in regard to planning for the future not only in terms of risk mitigation, but also just in terms of being able to leverage all the talent that exists across the world uh, and being able to take on more projects as they come on. Um, so this has been a really exciting last 12 months or so. Um, and we've been really happy to be able to help studios that have been looking to transition uh, away from being centralized in a central space, uh, given everything going on, of course, uh, as well as look to the future on how they become a more global studio moving forward. So that covers our virtual workstation section. I thought I'd move on next um, to rendering. Rendering has been something that we've been focused on really over the last few years. And along the way, we've learned quite a bit about what studios are looking for in, a, in, in rendering both uh, on-premise and on the cloud and ways that we can help. And I thought it might be a good idea just to kind of start with the basics here when we start to think about where rendering um, typically happens in a, uh, a high level pipeline. Uh, this is kind of a simplified view of what a, uh, a studio uh, undertaking a visual effects or animation project would be looking at in terms of uh, core things that'd be worked on. And, and this is definitely a simplification, simplification by the way. But if we look at uh, across modeling, surfacing, animation, simulation, uh, lighting, compositing, et cetera, uh, there are really three areas where rendering or uh, kind of batch uh, heavy compute operations typically exist. And it's in simulation. So you can think of big uh, Houdini fluid simulation jobs, uh, things of that nature. Lighting and rendering, uh, which of course has plenty of rendering involved. And then finally compositing, which is, you know, our uh, um, uh, will require quite a bit of compute, uh, just piecing things together in final comps and then on down to final imaging. And so one of the things we've noticed uh, is a common trend that we'll see as customers kind of start out here is they'll typically have a, uh, a set of capacity that they use on premise. Uh, so you can imagine here, uh, the x-axis represents uh, uh, working hours over the course of a day. Uh, the y-axis represents uh, the number of render machines that they have on premise. Uh, so right here we have 100. So this is kind of a, a small medium uh, size studio. And what generally happens over the course of the day is artists will start to submit jobs. Uh, we've got some early risers today starting to submit jobs at 6 a.m., 7 a.m., start to peak a little bit as we head into the morning. But eventually what happens is as things start to heat up during the day, you start to go beyond the amount of capacity that you need, right? So we have jobs and uh, related frames or computer operations kind of hanging out, waiting in queue 
waiting for things to free up so that they can get the compute necessary to complete the jobs. And the problem, of course, is you know waiting in production is not great. Uh, we're all on deadlines here. And what happens as a result is that compute gets moved down, uh, or, or down and over across later in the day. But of course, this starts to stack up over time, right? And jobs don't stop, uh, they keep coming, particularly as deadlines start to uh, uh, quick and fast approach. And so we're left with this issue where we're constantly trying to fight off um, overages that we see uh, in the render queues. So uh, this has been great for the coffee industry uh, in terms of having artists uh, hit the coffee bars or hit the kitchen to hang out and have some coffee while uh, uh, their jobs complete. But for production, not so great. Uh, and so we take a look at this other example over the course of a day and a half or so. Again, same amount of capacity. We're seeing the same sort of trends here. Uh, so naturally, the, you reach a decision here as a studio owner where you say, hey, look, do I just need to increase capacity so I could avoid these sort of bottlenecks? And so up we go, we purchase another 70-some-odd uh, machines. But the problem is, is we're still going to start to see uh, the capacity needs um, exceed what we have. And it continues on throughout, uh, uh, throughout the days and we still see more and more overages, but there's a hidden problem here uh, beyond just the overage. And that's results in wasted resources, right? Because we've bought all these machines, but the fact is, is over the course of the day, we're gonna have, as we have peaks in usage, we also have valleys in usage as well. And that means that the machines that we purchased uh, up front are sitting, collecting dust, waiting for jobs to hit them. Uh, and this really speaks to the nature of ultimately rendering workloads is a uh, very spiky workload. Um, but these, uh, these valleys are wasted opportunity uh, and are as equally as important as the peaks, uh, which means that we're wasting time as a result in terms of being, having to wait uh, for compute capacity to open up. So our thought here is that you know, if we take a look at uh, maybe reaching the end of a deadline in a project where we typically see spikes uh, going well beyond uh, uh, what capacity exists uh, on-prem, our, our, our thought process was, hey, this seems like a great idea where studios could potentially look out ahead, um, reduce their on-prem capacity, take the peaks that they forecast and simply move those to uh, the cloud to render. Makes sense, right? And we have seen this very, very often across many studios. Uh, and what's great about this approach is it allows you to take on peaks, many of which you, you don't even really see coming until you've hit them, be able to scale up EC2 resources, uh, use what you need and then spin them all the way back down. Uh, without paying any for anything other than what you actually use. But I think what's really interesting, and we explored this last year and it continues to be through over this, um, uh, over this current year, is that customers do do that, but what studios also do is now they see the cloud as an opportunity to get more iterations in over the course of an entire production. So instead of waiting until the very end and getting log jammed, Instead, they have the ability to get more revs on the shops that they're working on or pump up the quality on various assets faster by being able to render faster to see if the look dev kind of checks out, right? It, it's given studios more flexibility uh, to amp up the quality bar, which I think as we all know is constantly rising. Um, so I think that's been really interesting. And to talk a little bit about some of the customers uh, being able to leverage uh, EC2 resources effectively. Our friends at Method Studios have done exactly that for their recent work on Jumanji, the next level uh, that was released last year. They were able to use EC2 Spot. Uh, and for those who aren't familiar, Spot is our spare capacity um, that isn't being used uh, currently. We offer that at a steep discount up to 90% off. Uh, and that's great for rendering workloads because generally if, uh, if a render job is interrupted, it can be restarted again uh, or even checkpointed in many cases and not, not actually lose any of the work that you've done on long render jobs. 
Uh, but studios really like being able to use ET EC2 spot to be able to leverage a lot of the saving benefits that you have there and have uh, written functionality around spot to be able to um, use it very effectively. And so Method Studios is one of those um, operations that has done so. Um, so to dive a little bit into um, some of the exciting things uh, for this particular project, uh, they're able to peak at over 480 instances um, and was able to really scale what was a 10,000 for farm uh, 4X that capacity on AWS and push out 164 of the 280 shots that they had on this project through AWS. So really exciting work here. You probably saw some of their work on the uh, sizzle reel that we got to show at the top of this presentation. Um, really awesome work there. Another example would be our friends at Framestore who worked on uh, The Boys, a recent project uh, from Amazon Studios that was released on Prom Video recently, uh, season two coming soon. Uh, Framestore did some really great work on that project and similar sort of experience was able to use EC2 Spot effectively to be able to render out uh, specifically for their Los Angeles studio. Uh, they connected using Direct Connect into AWS regions uh, that made sense to them based on where their artists were um, and their ability to uh, peak up quickly. Uh, they were able to spin up up to 40,000 simultaneous cores during uh, their uh, crunch period, as we call it. And the um, uh, it worked out really well for them. And obviously, if you've seen the boys, uh, the work speaks for itself really awesome visual effects shots uh, in that series. Um, so yeah, great stuff by our friends from Framestore and definitely looking forward to more over the next year. So you might be thinking, you know, how, how would I get started with hybrid rendering? Um, you know, uh, if I'm a studio and I've been hitting these sort of problems before, you know, what is something that, uh, that I can take advantage of quickly? Uh, as many may know, um, ThinkBox is part of AWS uh, since 2017. Uh, and we have a product called Deadline that we've really focused a lot on being able to one, do a great job uh, or a continuing great job as being a great on-premise solution for customers to be able to manage their render workloads. But we put a lot of time and energy and worked with a lot of studios in making Deadline an awesome uh, hybrid solution to be able to easily extend into AWS to be able to leverage uh, EC2 and EC2 spot resources effectively. So this is a high level overview of kind of what an architecture would look like, a uh, combination of on-prem resources and map management, uh, being able to establish a secure connection uh, into portal resources that we have on the AWS side to be able to uh, render effectively with EC2 and then dump back out into S3 and then ultimately back on-prem to uh, get your final images or data files, as it were, uh, if you know doing things like simulation or fur caching or whatever else that's conducted to a batch workload, uh, Deadline can help with that too. So a lot of exciting things that we've done over the last year as it relates to really making this a great customer experience. I think uh, what you'll see coming up uh, is, is even more work uh, towards making this really easy to use configurable and ultimately something that studios large and small can use uh, in a way that's going to fit both their scalability and security requirements. So exciting things ahead. Now, as, as we talked about earlier with virtual workstations, software is just critically important to, to be able to have a great experience in rendering. In the end, it's not deadline or the render manager that's actually completing the render job per se, it's the underlying uh, software that's actually completing the rendering or the batch operation. So we have a wide variety of uh, software that's supported at the um, batch level, everywhere from Arnold to Houdini to Maya, New Keyshot, uh, even things like Yeti and Redshift on the GPU side. Uh, we have a broad ecosystem of software support um, that works out of the box today uh, if you're using Deadline. Uh, and then the other key thing is we provide a lot of this in a usage-based licensing format. So all the customers that you see here, including very recently um, Houdini Engine and Mantra uh, are able to be used on a per minute basis. So now all of a sudden you can say, hey, look, I have some jobs that uh, I need to render out quickly uh, at a um, high peak, but I don't wanna go out and buy a ton of licenses when I'm only gonna peak for say, a few hours or uh, even a few days. Instead, 
you can purchase licensing on a consumption-based standpoint and a pay-as-you-go model. And to be able to leverage licensing for these providers um, per minute, and then be able to only use what you uh, need and then use the rest later. Um, or, uh, But the idea is that you don't have to buy full annual licenses or monthly licenses. Uh, there's a level of granularity that will allow for some flexibility, which is great for rendering. Moving forward, uh, while we're on the topic of software, uh, as many in the industry know, uh, open source standards and libraries uh, continue to be critical um, for what we do in the content creation space. As we talked about last year at SIGGRAPH, uh, AWS is proud to be part of the Academy Software Foundation. Uh, we're about a year in. And what I can tell you is um, I, I couldn't be prouder of the mission that we're driving within the Academy around open source standards. And part of the reason why uh, that's been so effective is given the broad uh, membership that we have um, uh, across many studios, many vendors, uh, many software providers, all of us uh, pulling together in the same way to make open source uh, within the content creation industry meaningful and effective. Um, so you'll see plenty of familiar names uh, on this list. Uh, AWS is certainly proud to be part of this uh, really meaningful mission. Uh, and to talk a little bit about you know, uh, some of the projects that fall under the Academy of Software Foundation. Uh, you can take a look here a little bit about how we're structured. I won't go too much into the structure, but uh, more exciting to this audience, I think, is the projects. Um, some you might recognize in the form of OpenDDP, uh, OpenColorIO, uh, OpenQ, which is a recent one, uh, Open Shading Language, another recent one. Uh, we have a lot of really great projects that have had uh, meaningful influence on our industry for many, many years um, that the Academy has taken over to make sure that we continue to uh, push the needle here on their development, as well as be able to bring in new talent uh, to be able to contribute to these projects. Um, so our last uh, year as being part of this, uh, again, has been really exciting and uh, certainly looking forward to the next year as a, a, a career to this foundation. Uh, definitely go and check out the website if you have a moment. Uh, tons of content there. I'm showing kind of um, uh, some work that we've done to really kind of convey even the broader open source ecosystem, uh, even beyond the academy projects uh, that we're focused on. Uh, as you can see, a really diverse set of technology that studios are using every day, some in a very core way uh, to be able to produce the images and content that uh, we all enjoy today. So. Lots of great stuff here. Another thing I wanted to call out real quick is that uh, you know, the, the purpose of the Academy Software Foundation is really to drive forward uh, meaning initiatives within the open source community, but that can take many forms. And one of the things that we're really excited about is continuing to push on diversity and inclusion uh, within the Academy Software Foundation as a way of being community leaders within the space uh, to bring about positive change at the academy level. So some really great work is happening here uh, as of late. Um, I think I can speak for many when I say, with all going on in the world, uh, particular focus on this particular topic uh, is really, really important. Uh, and again, AWS is proud to be part of this initiative uh, and contributing to this important working group. So more to come here as we continue to identify the key goals and um, uh, what we're looking to uh, ultimately change and influence here as a working group. So some exciting things to head or ahead to be sure. So if you're interested in learning about more, uh, please take a look at our email lists. Um, uh, definitely look for ways that you can contribute. We make that really easy to do um, or get in contact with us directly. Um, uh, we of course uh, love being tweeted at <laughs> so feel free uh, uh, to do so in a nice way, hopefully. And uh, yeah, again, uh, some exciting things coming up this year for the Academy Software Foundation. So finally, uh, the third thing I want to talk a bit about is infrastructure on AWS and how that relates to creating content. Because beyond virtual workstations, beyond rendering, uh, there are other bits and pieces that AWS brings to the table that are really important at least we start to think about having a cohesive infrastructure uh, for a studio to operate on AWS and create content entirely on the cloud. So 
I'll show this map again uh, as a bit of a reminder here that uh, in many ways, your infrastructure already exists to create a global studio. Uh, AWS has regions all over the world that you can leverage to create a studio and be able to tap into talent uh, in multiple studio or cities and locations uh, that have uh, deep talent pools. And one of the things that we also like to talk about uh, is the idea of storage and file systems as well. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the solutions that we have natively as part of our offering with AWS. But the reason why I showed that map before is that anytime you see a blue dot, uh, it's more likely the case that we have these important uh, pieces of infrastructure ready to go and be used on day one. And so FSX is actually a, um, an important topic to talk about simply because in the end, you're going to need storage and a high performance file system to be able to work effectively in the cloud. Um, so FSX is one of our solutions. Of course, we have a Windows file server as an option. Uh, native Windows compatibility. We have a lot of customers that work on Windows, um, particularly ones that are focused on 3ds Max, of course. Um, uh, you know, it has fast and flexible performance, enterprise ready, and of course, is fully managed, um, uh, which is very appealing for folks that really want to get up and running quickly and have a high performance storage and file system solution. We, when we talk about Windows, of course, uh, we have to do a fast follow on Linux as well. As we all know, visual effects and animation, very Linux heavy. Uh, we had a really exciting release very recently as it relates to FSX for Lustre, uh, where now uh, updates to your S3 bucket will automatically update uh, your FSX for Lustre store as well. So you'll kind of see that we're continuing to add more and more value that our customers in the content creation space can really take advantage of very quickly. Uh, but yeah, really excited about this. We've actually been really interested in seeing the uptick in adoption in FSX in particular. Uh, we really work closely with the FSX team to make sure that requirements for the content creation industry are met. Um, so be on the lookout for more exciting releases uh, in regard to features and upcoming functionality with FSX. and something we're really excited about. And then finally, I, I talked about this a bit earlier, um, uh, equally important to things that we directly bring to bear in the form of services uh, that are native to AWS is our broad partner uh, ecosystem as well. Uh, so we talked a bit about Deadline, which is of course our own solution. Uh, we also have uh, Cumulo and Weka as great partners for us on the storage solution space. Kind of articulate this uh, a bit clearly. Uh, deadline, we provide a native solution to be able to hydrate uh, storage um, as part of the deadline solution and portaling into AWS. But you can also use Cumulo as a way of being able to do things like mixing Windows and Linux clients together. Say you have uh, application or applications that are only Linux or only Windows, having that mix and protocol is uh, helpful. Uh, the ability to scale to billions of files um, so a great partner in Cumulo. And then also Weka, and you'll hear a little bit about Weka here coming up from our friends at Untold. Another high performance uh, file system solution can leverage S3 and Amazon Glacier. Um, so you'll hear more about them coming up from Untold, uh, but another great partner for us uh, when thinking about uh, a high performance file system solution. So we've talked about three things here, rendering virtual workstations and infrastructure. And you know, as we talk through these, ultimately the key here is that all of these can come together. And when we pull all these together, that's what we mean by studio in the cloud. And this is something that we've really been talking about primarily over the last year. Uh, when I think about talking about this last year at SIGGRAPH, in fact, uh, we were really early on in trying to understand what was possible in this space. And over the course of this year, leading up to now, we've done a lot of work with customers, uh, big and small, and trying to figure out what's gonna be the best fit for them to be able to content or create content entirely on the cloud, start to finish. And so one of those exciting customers is Untold Studios. Uh, you'll see here uh, uh, Excitable Edgar, which you'll learn a little bit about here coming up uh, with Untold. Untold was our very first uh, cloud-based creative studio in the world, uh, working on some really exciting things. And I'm going to uh, 
hold my tongue here not to steal too much thunder for them uh, as they're coming up here next. Uh, but uh, as a high level overview, Untold Studios was the world's very first uh, uh, all in on the cloud uh, creative studio. Uh, and they've done some tremendous things over the last year and being able to create content entirely on AWS. Uh, and it's really all about all the things that I've spoken about really coming together based on the innovation that Untold was able to drive. Uh, everything from using virtual workstations uh, with our G4 instances to rendering with EC2 Spot uh, to leveraging Amazon S3 and Weka IO, as I mentioned earlier, all these things came together to be able to uh, drive a full studio in the cloud. Um, so yeah, really exciting to see this come together. And it's led to some really interesting projects. Um, I uh, talked a little bit about uh, Excitable Edgar. Again, you'll hear about that coming up. But Untold's also been able to work on um, some other projects that are uh, pretty amazing as well. Uh, you'll recognize uh, uh, the Queen Majesty uh, up above. Uh, Untold did some fantastic work for uh, Netflix's The Crown uh, recently. Uh, has done some tremendous uh, commercial work as well. Uh, you might recognize our... Uh, uh, a friend there at the bottom on the skateboard uh, as part of the sizzle reel that we showed recently. Uh, and the quote here from Sam kind of speaks from itself, uh, all the value props that we kind of talked about throughout this presentation all kind of came together for Untold, uh, which has of course really helped uh, in this year in particular, uh, but also helps Untold really think about the future and how they're able to uh, become a fully global studio and be able to expand in ways um, uh, that working on-prem makes it more difficult to achieve. Uh, so again, uh, I'll leave some of the further details to Untold uh, coming up here in our next presentation, but pretty phenomenal to see. Another customer creating content entirely on AWS is HiveFX. Uh, they'll be presenting tomorrow uh, on some of the work that they've been doing. They've been up to some really exciting projects uh, such as Spencer, Spencer's Confidential, and extraction, and they're able to achieve these shots using a combination of G4 instances, uh, primarily doing uh, compositing work with Nuke, uh, and then also carrying out uh, render jobs using uh, ThinkBox, Deadline, uh, and EC2 Spot instances. Uh, so again, we continue to see a lot of really great work. Uh, again, here's another shot from Spencer Confidential from Hive. Uh, being able to do things entirely on the cloud, uh, and it speaks to the idea that you can turn around even significant projects at high quality using entirely cloud resources. So uh, I thought I'd talk a little bit about how all this comes together here. And I, I think the, uh, I'll kind of step through this uh, a bit because there are many, many uh, uh, icons to go through. Uh, but uh, first is we kind of talk through um, um, uh, uh, the start of creating a studio. Uh, the admin is uh, <laughs> the person here is saying, hey, uh, moving to the cloud seems like a good idea. Uh, so we'll start there. And maybe they're starting out on a uh, on-premise studio. Uh, the idea here is that they want to start a studio entirely in a region. And what they do is they establish a, uh, a VPC, uh, which is their kind of a, a virtualized private cloud, as we call it a way of being able to isolate uh, their resources uh, within a uh, private environment. Uh, from there, uh, we have a something that we call availability zones. You can think of this as individual data centers uh, within regions. So if we imagine um, that someone wanted to start initially in our Portland region, PDX, um, you know, what would this, uh, what would this look like? Okay, we have two availability zones that we'll consider within that region. Uh, we set up a private uh, subnet uh, to adhere to proper security situ or considerations. Uh, we had bring in things like uh, our directory service, uh, which is very important for a lot of organizations uh, to take advantage of. Um, so we've worked with several customers that want to use our directory service. Uh, that coincides with our identity and access management, uh, IAM, as uh, many people know it. Uh, we also bring in uh, API Gateway and Route 53. These are some kind of state or table stakes uh, services uh, that we bring in. Uh, CloudWatch, tra CloudTrail to be able to audit uh, what's going on within our cloud infrastructure, which is actually a great value point to talk a bit about here because when you're able to use um, 
AWS for your entire studio, along for the ride, you also get access to the ability to um, audit usage at a much lower level uh, without having to necessarily build it yourself as maybe you would have in a on-premise setting. Uh, and it also allows you um, uh, access to metrics uh, to allow you to make better decisions on how you optimize your infrastructure moving forward. Um, so just a few things to kind of keep in mind and to be able to dive deep into. So uh, going from there, uh, obviously, as we talked about, need a file system, need S3, uh, the data needs to live somewhere. We provide exabyte scale level high performance storage. Uh, uh, many of our customers are working at a petabyte level, right? Particularly some of the larger studios, uh, those large fluid cache sims are, are not cheap in terms of uh, storage need. So uh, uh, it's important to have performance or high performance storage uh, to be able to accommodate that. Uh, if you're looking to down tier and uh, archive uh, your data, we provide uh, Amazon S3 Glacier, which allows you to uh, tier your data into uh, colder storage at a lower cost. Uh, so we bring a lot of options there. There's also Deep Glacier, by the way, if you want LTO uh, tape level sort of archiving um, where you can uh, stow it away and only bring it out in potential emergencies, that sort of thing, but obviously still wanna keep it. Uh, we have options for that. Uh, we also provide the ability to uh, have lower level introspection on cost and budgets and so forth. Uh, last I checked uh, uh, with my producer friends here, uh, tracking budget and cost is an important thing. Uh, so we bring a ton of uh, tools and insights to bear in terms of being able to track that effectively. Uh, so now let's talk a little bit about artists as well. Uh, uh, the really great thing about having a studio in the cloud is being able to onboard artists really becomes uh, as simple as being able to allow them to sign in to this infrastructure. So when we start to talk about a global workforce, when it stops turning into this idea of, hey, I've got to ship you a workstation or a laptop and uh, I need to, you know, I need to um, uh, provision this hard drive in a way and we have to jump through all these hoops and this and that just to bring on a single artist that may not be under the same roof as some of your other artists in a studio, uh, that's a lot of friction that many of our customers have communicated they really want to avoid. Uh, so what do we do with that? Well, if you use the cloud, it becomes less about uh, moving anything over and more about signing into the very same cloud infrastructure that uh, customer or your artist would use uh, uh, within the walls of the studio as well. I think that's an important value prop just to uh, dig into here. Uh, we talked a little bit about Amazon Machine Images. Uh, this is where all of your stock or your, all of your software is stored. Um, we provide Omnis, uh, particularly on the batch rendering side, that you can quickly use. That include all of your favorite software: um, Arnold, V-Ray, Houdini, etc. Uh, for virtual workstations, uh, you can bring your own software. And assuming that you already have licenses. Uh, for Maya, Houdini, and other applications that you wanna use, we make that really easy for you to pick and choose the applications that you wanna to add to an AMI, and then you simply use the licenses that you've already uh, procured today uh, with the vendors that you're comfortable working with. Um, so that's the AMI. We then move into the G4 instances, as we talked about, this is the backing instance of our um, uh, G4 workstations or our GPU backed workstations. Uh, we then move into security considerations. Um, uh, we allow customers to be able to encrypt uh, in motion or at rest. Um, so important thing to keep in mind for those uh, uh, looking after the security of their studio. Um, we're able to provide direct connect uh, connections into this infrastructure, uh, not, not mandatory, but for larger studios they are gonna have, you know, hundreds of artists and need the direct connection and the bandwidth associated. Uh, we provide direct connect as a way of having uh, um, uh, kind of that next level of uh, data streaming capability. Uh, uh, this is just a way of being able to say, hey, um, uh, as you have in your studio, you can easily replicate this in a remote, uh, a remote environment uh, as we spoke about. Uh, and then finally, we can add in things like rendering. Uh, we provide uh, AWS's uh, ThinkBox deadline, as we've talked about, uh, which allows you to uh, easily um, uh, expand out your render resources using the very same cloud resources and infrastructure that we're talking about here. 
And then finally, again, using spot instances, uh, the favored approach <laughs> for content creators, uh, given the advantage on price here, um, uh, that's ended up being really effective and to be able to auto scale that easily based on the work that you're bringing to bear uh, important as well. Um, and then we add some other things like being able to leverage uh, the trusted advisor um, uh, solution uh, that we have as well to make sure that you're on the right track, um, uh, that you're citing things that may need to change or could be optimized, uh, a really great resource there. So putting it all together, I went through many, many icons there. Uh, you might be thinking to yourself, wow, uh, maybe I'm only on the creative side. Um, uh, I'm not an IT professional. Uh, I'm not an engineer. Am I going to be able to uh, put this together? Uh, I would tell you the answer is a emphatic yes, you can. And we've really put a lot of time and resources based on the learnings that we've had in putting together a full studio in the cloud um, is we've been able to put together a, um, a very detailed tutorial on how to get started yourself. So I invite everyone that's interested, definitely check out our guide, uh, use the link uh, as I've posted. Um, uh, really exciting to see even folks that um, are small shops that don't have dedicated technical resources be able to uh, onboard themselves entirely on AWS and to create content uh, entirely on the cloud. That's been super rewarding to see over this year. Um, and uh, equally rewarding is just to see all the phenomenal work that's come from our customers uh, over this last year. Uh, we're excited to learn even more from you all uh, over this next year. And um, I now charge you to go and create. Uh, <laughs> that is the name of the game. And uh, we are here to help. Uh, I will leave you at that uh, because uh, now more than ever, uh, we're really looking to be in a place where we help customers achieve uh, doing bigger and better things uh, entirely on the cloud um, uh, to go forth. And uh, I thought I'd conclude um, by just talking a little bit about uh, what we have upcoming in the day. Hopefully you'll stay tuned. Uh, as I talked about earlier in my presentation, we have Untold Studios coming up next to talk about how they were able to become the very first uh, creative uh, studio to go all in on the cloud. Uh, so some really exciting uh, stuff coming from them. Uh, and then stay tuned tomorrow. We have some other presentations coming up as well from our friends at HiveFX, Cinesite, and then we have a great panel coming up uh, that will talk a bit about virtual workstations and the success we've had uh, there. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for your time. Uh, really enjoy talking about uh, all the exciting things we've had uh, over this last year, and uh, we'll be looking forward to a really exciting year coming up. Thanks. Mm -hmm.